everybody, welcome. Thank you so much for being here, for coming to our talk, uh, co-creation between UX and software. How are we today? Are we good? Let me, yeah, thanks. A little bit energy, good. It's the first real conference day of DevOps, so we are all still very excited. The energy is still pretty high, so um, let's work with that. To begin, I'm very curious, can I see some hands? Who of you is a software developer? Okay, okay, well, that, that's definitely the majority. And then I'm curious, who of you consider yourself a designer? Hands up. Okay, <laughs> that, that's a little bit less. <laughs> I think we had like five hands, something like that. But cool, welcome also to the uh, designers, welcome. Uh, very happy you could make it. Um, who of you, and I'm talking to the entire room, not only to the designers, but who f uh, is working closely together with the other discipline currently already? Can I see some hands? Okay. 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 And who of you would like to work more closely together? That's more hands. Hey. Now I get more hands. Now we yeah. can work with that, right? <laughs> okay. Now we know a little bit more about you. Uh, let uh, let me introduce you to us. This is Tamar. Tamar is the Global Director User Experience Design of Adidas. Pretty amazing. Uh, and she lives and breathes everything that's sport related. Actually, she's currently training for her fifth den in karate, which is super high. So if you don't know, just take it from me. It's very high. It's <laughs> very impressive. Um, and when it that comes down to work, she really gets motivated by simplifying things. So she believes that people are not stupid. Don't know where she get that from, but yeah, <laughs> people are not stupid. Things are just not designed the way you would expect it to. Now with that in mind and Adidas saying impossible is nothing. Yes, thank you for that introduction. So let me introduce you to my co-speaker, Simone. Um, she actually graduated as a speech therapist. And then when she practiced that, she saw that she really liked the analytical and problem solving part, but less being the therapy part. Um, so she did a traineeship to become a developer and now is one of the rock stars, I can say, at Open Value Amsterdam. So <laughs> I'm very happy to stand on stage together with Simone today. Thank you so much. So let me continue to letting you know what we're going to talk about today. So it's all about how can we best co-create between designers and developers. And we're first going to zoom in to, OK, what does that mean for a team? What kind of team do you need? Then we're going to dive into the process and then the details of how you can use that process, certain tools uh, that you can use to co-create together. Yeah. Now, you might wonder why we are here. Maybe you're even wondering, why am I here? <laughs> so let me clarify that a little bit for you, because if you are going to stay with us for 50 minutes, it's kind of important that something on, of this talk resonates with you. Now, Tamar and I met during a podcast where we were invited to talk about um, how you take a user problem or opportunity into account whenever doing your day-to-day -day job. And that can be from a developer perspective or from a designer perspective. And we came to the conclusion that we were really passionate about the fact that we think if we start working cl more closely together, we get a greater and a better user uh, product outcome. And therefore, our work becomes so much more satisfying. So let me give you a little example. In this example, we have a painter. And this painter, he draws paintings. That's what painters do. And one day he gets an assignment from a middleman. And the middleman is asking him to create a painting for one of his customers. The painter goes ahead and creates the most beautiful painting he has ever made. Ta-da! He's super happy with it. And he goes back uh, to the customer, presents uh, the end product, very excited. 
but the customer is not. The customer actually really likes and is very into abstract art. So he would have liked to have seen something more like this. Next to that, he would actually love to hang the uh, painting outside in the garden. But because the painter never knew about the situation, he used watercoloring, meaning that with the next rainfall, painting would be destroyed. Now, two things are happening here. First of all, the painter didn't know about his customer or the developer in this case didn't know about his customer. So he could not anticipate on the needs of that customer. Secondly, the middleman forgot to mention the situation wherein the painting would be hanging later on. Now, you might argue if that is the fault of the middleman, the designer in this case, but the middleman never knew about the toolkit of the painter. He didn't know that there are apparently multiple kind of paints that you can use for creating a painting. He thought, yeah, you have red and blue and orange and yeah, there you go. Um, so if you don't know about that, if you don't have that knowledge, you cannot give information about that, right? So it's not really his fault. So with this example, we, might, uh, we want to show you the importance of working together because we think that you are always um, having some blind spots within your own discipline. You cannot fully anticipate on the other. And therefore, whenever we start drawing it out together, we will see those gaps in an earlier stage and can anticipate better on it. Now, that sounds all amazing, right? But I can already hear you say, Simona, that's lovely. We have had tons of people telling us this. We have had a manager even telling us that we should work closer together. But I just have some concerns. Yeah, we already have too many meetings. Yeah, and what really annoys me is that they just don't get us. Whenever I start talking about the technical implementation, Yeah, and I cannot really guarantee the quality of my work when I need to deliver a hundred things at the same time. Now, will I also be responsible of making the design? <laughs> well, we have roles for reasons, right? Does everybody need to own the same skills? Well, I just tune out whenever they start talking about their part of the process. Hey, I don't get paid to do all that work. <laughs> nice. I really heard this in practice. <laughs> I really like it. Nice. And we are laughing about it, but it's actually all of those are very valid concerns. And you are very uh, right to have those concerns, to raise those concerns. And that is actually why we are here, to address those and hopefully take them out a little bit of, out of the way so that at the end of this talk, you have some practical tools on easing out the collaboration. Yeah. So the first thing I look at as a manager as well, when we go into a new project, like, okay, how do we get a team together to work on that project? And we always start with, okay, what's the type of project? And do we have designers, developers, or people that we need to have involved who really have passion for working in this type of project? Uh, so that's the first thing I look at. And then I look at the personality of people. What are their, their mindsets and their values? And do we empower these people with these personalities to come together to create this right team? And then, of course, we need to look at the skill set. And I think a lot of you would have started with the skill set. Like, we need someone who can write this type of code, do a bit of motion design if we need it, and this and this and this. But I really want you to look at the entire triangle here, because the skill set is just part of it. And then, once you are that team and you start working together, all of you need to know the team's purpose and you need to align on that. Yeah, why are you making it? Why are you making it? 
And I really like uh, what um, someone said. It's, he's called Simon Sinek. I don't know if you've heard of it, but he lo really looked into the psychology of why certain teams work better than other teams. And it is the same thing on why you buy a product. It's people don't buy what you do, but they buy why you do it. And what you do simply provides what you believe. So thinking of why did I join Adidas? I could have joined any other company. Or why did you join the company that you work at right now? I joined Adidas because I believe in their vision, their mission, and all the statements around sustainability that they're making. And I want to be part of that because I believe in that. I believe we can create better athletes um, and we can do good for the world and we can recycle plastic in the shoes that we wear, you name it. I really, that really resonates with me. I also really joined Open Value because they love drinking beer and I do <laughs> as well. So that's great. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, you nice. drink the beer, I do the sports. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, with that in mind, um, we want to go a little bit ahead to creating the team structures. So you might wonder whenever you start working together, what is the best way to create your team structure? Do you get the designer inside the team, outside the team, in a different building? Like it can be all kinds of things, right? Uh, but first of all, I want to start with the fact that we think collaboration isn't the holy grail. It's not that every team should work closely together with designers because just as Tamar told us, it's all about the purpose of your team. Does it make sense, right? So the very first example that I would like to give is an operations team, a team that is just working on a network layer, for example, or an infrastructure layer, uh, a team that doesn't have any UI involved or no end users that are going to use their uh, products in a direct manner. Of course, they are using it indirectly, we all know, but not in an indirect manner. And I think you also have a great example from Adidas, which is not that much about a network team, but still a team. Yeah, you can, you can look at it, for instance, we have different business units, right? I think everybody knows Adidas in a different store. So you have original stores, you have outdoor stores, you name it. So we have different business units. And of course, you want the cash flow to go to the right business units to track if they're successful. And that is one of the examples that doesn't need a designer, but it does need to be built in the correct way. So that most probably is a team with mainly developers. Nice. Now the second team is a team where developers or designers are involved, and that is called the process team. For the people who look really sharply, they might notice a small difference in color between the developers and the designers. Um, if this works, yeah, it does. Like the people with the purple heads, you see them writing on like a iPad or something. Like we don't do that, right? We don't write code on iPad. So it's not developers. <laughs> we are here. <laughs> but um, this process team consists of a mixture. And in general, you see that those teams are responsible for an end-to-end -end project for an entire customer journey. So they have everything within the team uh, because they own that entire journey, which doesn't need to be something that the customer goes through at that very moment. It can also be something that goes on for a few weeks, right? Just a journey wherever a user is going through. Now, this is great, but you can't, but in most cases, when a company is growing, it becomes a little bit more complicated to keep this structure in place. And that is mainly because we want to have um, the same look and feel in different parts of our company instead of every team that's responsible for their own customer journey and creating their own products, making like a very isolated island-like um, structure. Uh, and that is why we also have feature teams. And the feature teams uh, has as a structure on top, they have the designers, 
which are responsible for multiple customer journeys. They take care of the overview. They keep in mind that everything belongs together. Um, and then below that, you will find multiple developer teams. And the developer teams are responsible for one or more features. And they take their responsibility on that part. So, for example, um, if you have a chat box, you don't want to have a different chat box in different parts of the application. So maybe this team is responsible for the chat box and the designers will grab all the functionality they need to provide one user flow. Do yes. you have like also an example how that Definitely. works? Definitely. So this is, for instance, a team Take the team I work in at the moment, we're designing the end-to-end -end flows for when people are visiting our stores. Um, so we want something on the iPad uh, for our employees so they can check the stock and restock, you name it. Um, but also you want things for your consumers, right? If they come in, they also want to see if you're in front of a footwear wall. Do you have this in stock in my size or do you have it in different colors? What can I try on? You name it. If you enter a fitting room, we have a smart mirror that you can stay in the fitting room. If it's too big, I just order a smaller size. Then the message goes, the notification goes to the employee iPad app and they come and bring it. So it's all the time a process that continues um, and it's really that journey with multiple touch points that the designers all the time need to take care of. But it will be different feature teams building those different features. Cool, thanks. Now, last but not least, uh, we have project teams. I don't want to stick too long to them. Project teams are teams that are more temporary, uh, temporary and they create either a feature or a part of uh, a user flow. And after they build it, they will hand it over to either a feature team or a process team. And why I wanted to point this out is because it's up to you if you want to have the designers inside of that team structure. Uh, but in either way, you do need to have a very close line with the team you're delivering for. Because it's not fun for anyone when you start working on a product and you work on it for a month or maybe even longer and then you hand it over and the team you're delivering for is not happy that that doesn't make sense and on the other hand it's also a very annoying if you're in the team in the process team and then you get something from a project team and you're like damn this is not what i asked for so yeah always keep a short line with the team that you're working for now this is short overview um don't want to stick to it too long. Let's move on to the process. To the process, yes. So if we look at the process, we always look at it from a business lens. So you understand your company's vision, mission, strategy and purpose. Uh, and of course, with that, you have your team purpose. And then we have the design cycle. So we put here a screenshot of um, uh, Nielsen Norman that is very well known in the design community of what that process looks like. So you start with really understanding, understanding the user, understanding the problem, the opportunities and the solutions. Um, and then you go ideate on those solutions. You prototype them into the explore phase and then you materialize them. So then you really want to test them and implement them. And if we go from the implementation, then we dive into development. Yeah, and this is probably very common, the DevOps cycle. We all have seen it before, right? Uh, the very nice part where you first start with developing it and after you move to production, it gets to the operation cycle where you're going to maintain and mentor it, uh, monitor it, sorry. Um, yeah, so it's very familiar, but we are kind of feeling that this actually leads to an isolated approach. Yeah, it's two different models. Exactly. So that is why we came up with a third model. <laughs> Ta-da! The design dev ops model. Um, so this is then the, the part. We all start with the plan. 
Yes. Oh, do I your take magic. my magic wand. <laughs> yes. Plan. So you start with the plan, and then you go into the design cycle uh, that we just mentioned, and then you go into the development cycle, and then the op cycle, and then again, again plan, right? Because you learn, you monitor, you learn, you continue. So let's see where we can co-create. So we looked into this and in the purple parts, we see that we really want to work together. So as soon as you've defined your um, design direction, you know what the direction is, you know what you want to solve, um, then the ideation we would like to do together because I can ideate a lot from consumer experience, but Simone can also really ideate from what is feasible and maybe some How new much things. effort it takes. Yeah. Definitely. And then you prototype. And a lot of times you want to prototype fast because you want to learn and oh. fail fast. <laughs> but I've learned that I can prototype fast, but sometimes a developer can even prototype faster. Hey. So there also you want to communicate and say, okay, how can we best test this to really get a validated end result? And then you validate, and that's really nice if you, you know, most probably the designer will do the interviews with the users and, and look into that, but be part of that. So if you can be part of that, you know, uh, uh, join a watch party or these kind of things, do so because you learn a lot around the user and I've had it before that I ended the day of testing and I walked out of the test room and then the developer said I was listening and I immediately fixed it. Yeah, that's great that's if fast. you can make that happen. But I also think it's quite important because if we are part earlier on, then we get involved on the why. Then we get really have a feeling of why we are creating it and we have a better understanding of where our product should go in which direction it should go um, instead of like starting from the code part yes. so yeah definitely yeah and then if you look into the the test cycle always you know lay it again in front of the designer to um to you know work together and see was this actually the thing that we wanted to create together uh, and then monitoring, again, the designer can support on creating the empathy and really looking into the user's cycle to see if they really use it as intended or maybe also in a different way. Yes, for sure. So let's, let's dive, dive in. in. Let's dive into the, the understand uh, phase. That's, so that's the empathize and define phase. All right, here um, we go. What we do, a lot of user research, but also <coughs> research that comes from just monitoring, looking at the data, uh, you name it. And then what we do is journey mapping. And journey mapping, I want to dive into a bit closer because I think this is also something that you can use in development. A lot of times we really look at a persona, so a certain user group that you can identify with and you have a certain scenario. So for instance, someone is making a click and collect purchase order online. And then you go through the phases. Um, a lot of times I make drawings, as you can see in a lot of the drawings in the presentations, just to visualize a bit and create that empathy uh, within the business. And we write down the phases. And then you have the user actions. Now we have one line of user action, but for a click and collect, it is multiple lines, right? Because we have the consumer, we have the warehouse staff that needs to collect uh, the items, send it to the store, and there you collect it. So there you have the employees as well uh, who need to, to use their software, their end of the software to, uh, to look up your order, make sure we give the right order to the right person. Then you create this empathy map, really see how does this go currently and how are users feeling. And then you know also the pain points and the delighters. And a lot of times I see people really um, fixating on the pain points mm. and that is good because if you have one pain point, you need at least five to seven happy points to 
that's to quite a lot. That. Yeah, that's a lot. So definitely fix your pain points first. But the delighters are also important that you know about them because you don't want to delete your delighter while fixing the pain point. Yeah, and it will also create engagement, I would say, right? Yeah, yeah. And of course, if you can uplift the, uh, the delighter even more, make that your USB compared to the competition, that's even better. So from these pain points and delighters, you map out the opportunities that you see and you brainstorm into uh, solutions. But before you go into those solution brainstormings, you want to map out an opportunity map. And of course, when you map that out, you're going to look at what is high effort and what is high or low value. And as a business, of course, we want to pick up at first the high value, low effort items, because then immediately we can have an impact. And here, when we started talking, we saw the elephant in the room, so to oh, say. Oh, man. Yes, I think this is really the first point inside the, the entire process where I really saw, like, yeah, th this is where we start working together and there is so, such a big need of working together because how many times have we had the situation where a PO came up to us and told us, we are going to build this with deadline that and maybe solution direction X, I, Z, something. And you have one day. Well, but how does he know? How does he know? Like he didn't inform the developers. He didn't r ask for any input from the developers. I am shocked with how many times it occurs that we are left in the dark and then we just get an assignment and we're like, <laughs> I, I don't get this. So of course the PO and the designers are so very capable and we need them to estimate the value. However, they need us <laughs> to tell us about the effort. So yes, this is really the first point where it all comes together. And from that point on, uh, you might have figured out together where you are going to start with. What product are you going to deliver? What kind of problem? What kind of opportunity? But before you dive directly in to the technical solution, we first need to see what it really holds. This is just very high over, right? Like we have no deal tools whatsoever at this point. So then we need to dive in. And I'm now going to give you a tool, just something that can help you collaborate closely here together between designers and developers. Um, and there are a lot of other tools also out there, but I really like this one. It's not an event storming talk. So if you really enjoy it, dive in further after it is talk. But I will give you a slight introduction into it. First of all, I would say, if you can go to the office for this session, at least make sure you are in the same room. You can do it online. However, it is so much more stronger if you really close your laptop for once <laughs> and have the sticky notes out and start drawing it out together. Get a whiteboard uh, and share the sticky notes around. And then you first are going to start with the events. The events are things that have happened in the past. So they did already happen. So you write them down past tense. And to facilitate this, it's easier to write down at least the start event and the stop event. And then you just let the room do its job. So everybody is writing it down. It just, they will just hang it on the board. It doesn't need to be chronological at that time. Um, and you're just brainstorming. And you're also brainstorming on the things that are maybe a little bit outside of the box because brainstorming is all about getting more like getting more clear wherever you can go and it helps so much if you point out the outliners as well so go wild 
uh, write it down. And after all, everybody has put it down in the sticky notes, you're going to get the repetitions out, like the things that have been uh, double, and you are going to chronolog uh, to make it in a chronological order. After that, you will add the comments to it. So what led to that event? Uh, maybe someone, uh, maybe a button was clicked or something like that. Uh, if you know what the command was, then you need to know what the triggers are. Is it a human trigger? Is it a user? Is it maybe time-based? Uh, it can be anything, right? So from that point, you need to figure out what are different conditions, like have we, do we have multiple pathways that can lead to different scenarios? And last but not least, because at this point you're almost done, but then you are going to write down aggregates or domains. And this is whatever belongs together. And that makes sense because a user in the first part of the process can be a user with a name and an email address, whereas the user in the last part of the process maybe also needs to have a date of birth and an address and something else. So by defining the domains, it makes it more easy to talk between the different disciplines, what are we talking about and about whom are we talking. So this could, this is a little example how it could look like in practice, it's something from a previous uh, job I did. And from that point, we continue with yeah. the creation. So what we've done so far together now is got looked at the journey, the opportunity, we mapped them, and then together we ideated on some of the solutions. And what I always would like to do, and, and please do that, is always keep track of your solutions. Because if someone new joins the team, he might come up with, a new, with the same solution again, and you are like, yeah, we tried that a year ago, but I don't know why anymore, but it didn't work. But what if it didn't work because it was not feasible yet? And it might be feasible now. So that's where, you know, you really want those indicators saying what, uh, what you know, what really worked, what didn't work, then why it didn't work. Keep, keep that in your documentation. And then my second tip is always just focus on one solution at a time. Uh, as a team as well. Can we do five things at the same time? Nope. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> and then let's dive into the design process. So then we start really, you know, making a mock-up of it. Um, so we go from more block framing to wire framing and start validating as soon as possible. Uh, it doesn't need to be a finished design. A lot of our users really understand already a wireframe and you validate, you validate, and then when you know for sure you're in the right direction, then you go into creating your gyro tickets for a lot of people, I think, or your <laughs> development tickets and, and start developing in. Um, yeah. I would not start developing before this, other than maybe a quick prototype together, because what if from the validation it comes that nobody really likes this solution? then you've done a lot of work for nothing. And I think it's also important to uh, mention and point out that we are continuously talking about co-creation, but uh, just like one of the concerns stated at the more earlier uh, state, that I feel we have a problem with defining what is whose responsibility. And we now took a closer look on the design cycle, but does that also mean that we are responsible as developers? I'm now sorry, I'm now talking about us as developers, but is it our responsibility, uh, is the outcome that comes out of this our full responsibility? Well, it depends. <laughs> um, first, I would say how we see it, it's a shared responsibility on the end product. We are all responsible for the end product and by working closely together, we are involved in a more earlier stage and because of that, we can give input and feedback in a more earlier stage. However, we also still very much believe in everybody's own speciality and their own qualities and your own discipline. So how 
even though we are working together, uh, there are definitely some parts of the process where design is responsible of, and we as developers can review that and give our input on that. Um, so it's a shared model, I would say. So if we've looked at all of this, we've done the event storming, uh, you name it, and we validated the solution, we know this is the solution that we're going to go after, then we highly recommend to make a blueprint. It's like a blueprint of your house, right? You're not going to start building a house if you don't know where the kitchen or the bathroom or the living room will be. Um, and here you can reuse a lot of the things that we've done before, um, but really map it out so that it's clear for everyone in the team that what are the user actions, but also what are the front stage and backstage actions and what are the supporting processes that you need. Because if you start developing this and you work in multiple teams, so for instance, you work in these feature teams, so what if you know, in, in the third stage, I'm actually in the fitting room at Adidas requesting a different size, but the employee never gets the notification. That doesn't work, right? So at least then you have the blueprint of the full process that you want to develop together, and then you can start developing and also keep planning together yeah, what I really like. Yeah, what yeah. I really like about having really this visualization because it still might sound a little bit abstract, but we're kind of talking quite practically. We are challenging you and your designers to really map this out and create something like this as documentation because this is also the input for your Jira tickets or any other tool that you are using, but for your tickets. Uh, because I've been in a lot of refinements where you talk for two hours and it's quite complex and then at the end it's like, oh, uh, hey, uh, you, can you create the user stories out of it? Um, and then you might forget a user story because you do it from your head. Um, and then when you're done, you're kind of missing something. And then whose fault was it? Was it the developer that forgot or were the requirements of design not clear enough? It's like this fake state where everybody's a little bit responsible, uh, but by really having this, you have your tickets and you can just look at that for uh, or as input. So that's quite nice. Okay, so this is the part that you've all co-created together. You know the journey, you know your opportunities and the solutions you're going after, and you mapped your tickets. So you're ready to go into development. Hey, the fun part. Yes, nice development, finally, some might say. But uh, we, were, we were involved in the, in the past part, like uh, don't think this is where you come in. Uh, we are go now going to talk about development and when we're going to talk about development, I want to mainly focus on the part where we make technical designs. So the part, hopefully, <laughs> before starting to code. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, the technical design and I think in general, we underestimate our designers a little bit. Um, we often feel that our technical design is way too complex for them and they will not get us. In general, that's true if you just talk about it. But designers are in general quite visually uh, strong, like they, they get quite a lot if you draw it out for them. So here are some tools how to draw out your technical design. We uh, go over a few UML um, options for you. First of all, it being the process flow. It looks, of course, a little bit like the event flow, right? But a great difference is that with the event storming outcome, you had an outcome of the user experience, of the user flow. There was no technical implementation details available at that point. Uh, so it was really a, something you do before the wireframes are coming into order. This, however, is something you do after it has been validated, validated and you're going to really draw it out. You can, you can, you might argue if uh, you want to do this. I do like to challenge the fact that process flows in general are being created by one person 
and then after, if you're lucky, it's being reviewed by one of the teammates. Uh, but you can also make this into a refinement session and draw it out together, which I think would benefit because the more people look at it, the more diverse it is and the more uh, fitting the outcome will be. Now, this you can definitely do with a designer. It, it's not that weird to involve them in this process because they get a little bit more feeling about what they are requesting of us. The same goes with a sequence diagram. How, how big is it for you? Can you, no, you cannot really read it, right? Oh, but you get an impression. How many of you, uh, let me see some hands, how many of you do use sequence diagrams or have used them in the past? Okay, that's great. A lot of you, a and lot of can you. Can I then ask how many of you shared that with a designer? That's a good question. Two, three, uh, yeah, bit more. maybe 10. Yeah, maybe but 10, less than 10%, I would say, yeah, of everybody yeah. who raised their hand. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, uh, and th that makes sense because it, it seems a little bit te more technical maybe, but for a designer, often their request ends whenever something is going to the back end. And then for them, it might seem like a black box, like there's some magic, and then a result is coming out what we requested. However, by telling them and by showing them how many factors and actors you have within that backend, you can make it way more clear where the issues might lie. And you make, can maybe a little bit more elaborate on why the performance is so low, because we are get, like you are asking for something and we need to go to 10 different systems for that. That doesn't make sense. Maybe we can split it up. And by showing it, they can also think along, right? This is, with the example of the painter, this is really where we, we have toolkits and where the other discipline doesn't know about. But if you invite them to look at your toolkit, they can at least cooperate or they can um, use that within their design and within their solution. Now, something that's pretty nice if you draw out a sequence diagram is that you might show it to your designer and you might say, okay, so I draw it out, draw it out that when I show uh, an order to a customer and the customer doesn't uh, want that order and he declines the order, then he gets to be returned to his basket. Now, this it would be the time where you can challenge that, right? Like, oh, I don't want him to go to the basket. I first want to have a warning. I first want to, like, do you really want to decline this order? Something like that. This is where you can really talk about the design. Same goes with what are you returning as an error? Uh, what does the user get to see whenever the error is being transformed? Uh, trans no, forwarded, <laughs> not trans, just forwarded, forwarded to the, to the front end. Maybe we don't even want to have an error. Think about that. That would be nice. Oh, yeah. man. That would be a nice user experience if it, the user didn't even notice there was an error. And you can also point out the gaps. Maybe we, uh, when we are start drawing it out, we can see we have a third party. And third parties are scary. They can be down. We don't have a lot of influence on them. And we might talk with our designers on how we want to deal with that kind of situation. All right. Last but not least, uh, the entity relationship model. So this is really about your data structure. And I think in general, uh, this as well, we don't share that often with our designers. But I think... It would be a good practice if we start to, because they can challenge us on the data if we really need that data. Because nowadays it's quite important to be secure, right? And the more data we hold, the, the more riskier it gets. The less data, the better. Um, so whenever you start talking about the data, maybe you can remove some or you can make stuff more isolated or integrated, just uh, whatever it needs. All right, and with all that in mind, we have this beautiful technical design. We're super proud, we collaborated, bam, we're starting to code, awesome. Um, and then we come out with something that can be tested. So there you come in again, right? Yes, because here you, of course, want to cross-check, was this 
this actual the experience that I developed was that the experience that we had in mind in the beginning. And you could even do a very fast test with users if you want to, but always you know, show it to the designer and say, hey, can we delight it here or there? Maybe with you know some tweaks or some motion designs or maybe just some Martians and some paddings that need to be improved. Um, but yeah, it works here very well to work together again. All right, hopefully all went very well and we are actually ready to move to production. So we're moving to our operation cycle. Uh, we're going to release, um, which is great. Um, we put it out there in production um, and then we get to a point where we actually need to stop. I think in general, we rush forward to the next release. We just like, okay, it's on production, let's go. Let's do the next release. Let's go to the next feature. And maybe if you have someone who likes monitoring or tracing or something else, you, ha you are in luck that he maybe creates some dashboards or some extra tooling. But in general, it's something that's been done on the side. And I would really like to argue if that is the way to go. I think we should spend more time on our operation cycle and we should have just as we have development tickets, we have should we should have ha oh, we should have monitoring cycles and monitoring uh, user stories and tickets so that we get time and we can focus on them and we can really make something nice. Because a lot of times the things that we want to know are also interesting for designers. Because if I want to know what the CPU is of the thing I've built and how much it uses, then that is also very, well, very valuable input for the designers because that will do something to the performance, right? Uh, and I want to know how many errors there were. Uh, maybe I want to know that because from a bug point of view, but you also want to know it from a user experience point of view, right? Because Error flow is most co uh, commonly not a happy user experience. Yes, and if it takes a bit longer than expected, we might want to design a loader or exactly. any other de delighters for the user. So we really look at it from a user point of view. We take out the user and then look at the data, which gives us a lot of input into this recurring cycle again. Yeah. All right, cool. And with that in mind, we're getting to the end of this presentation. Here are some few key takes away of what we just talked about. It starts with the team structure. That's where we started this talk. And it really is based on the why. Why, why are you in this team? What are you creating? What is your vision? What is your purpose? And with that information, you are forming your team structure, the people in it, but also the disciplines in it. Then you start to incorporate the design into the development cycle so that it's really an integrated process and not something isolated. The responsibility is a part where we really need to focus on and also split it up a little bit, like the responsibility of the end product lies with the entire team. However, there is also room and space for personal responsibility as a discipline. And in order to have that, we need to have trust. So invest in the trust you have within your team, because without the product, you will see it in the product. Um, and then just from a very practical perspective, find a language to talk to each other. If you are stalking, uh, starting to talk about like bytes and, and annotations and stuff, like of course the designer will somewhere along the way tune off. That makes sense. But when you are drawing it out, when you're making it visually and we are starting to map it out together, then I'm very sure we can find a way of collaborating. And then last but not least, spend proper time on your operation cycle because that also will give you the input 
for the new cycle. Yes. All right. These are some tips and resources that we've used. Uh, so check it out if you'd like. And with that being said, we want to really thank you. Enjoy the rest of your DevOps. Here are the slide deck. And I hope to see you around for a drink somewhere. Yes. <laughs>